number of law firms. Um, most recently, before he took his government position, the law firm of Allen and Overy in Amsterdam. In his work as a litigation attorney, the minister focused chiefly on collective labor disputes, works, counsel issues, and individual employment issues. He also advised management and supervisory boards on governance. From 2015 to September of 2017, he was actively involved in the Allen and Overy um, CSR policy as chairman of its board. From 2005 onwards, he was also a part-time professor at the European Employment Law um, at the, and I'm going to mess up the name of the university, I apologize, um, Maastricht. I know I messed that up, sir. Okay. I apologize, my students will be horrified. Um, on October 26, 2017, Minister Grapperhaus was appointed as the Minister of Justice and Security um, by the government. Um, I would like us all to welcome the minister to stage and let's hear, and I will reserve the right to ask the first question of you, minister. Thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, um, less than a mile from here in the Library of Congress, you can find a unique treasure, the first map of the world to use the name America. It was made by the German cartographer Martin Waldse Miller and first published in 1507. And to be honest, the name America is placed on what is now known as Latin America. Anyhow, it was proof that the Roman poet Virgil was right, that there was a land that lies beyond the stars, beyond the paths of the year and the sun, where Atlas, the heaven bearer, turns on his shoulder the axis of the world set with blazing stars. Now, Walt St. Miller based his map on the travels and discoveries of Ptolemy, Amerigo Vespucci, and no surprise, Christopher Columbus. Explorers who sailed the seven seas in order to discover new trade routes, new products, new trade partners. Indeed, also in those days, money made the world become round. These men, yes, I'm sorry, all men, these explorers and cartographers made the unknown into the known, because in the unknown there were dragons. Now the world of these explorers was a world of land, sea, and air. Dangerous, but visible, definable, finite. In the last 70 years, we expanded that known world in two directions, up and everywhere. We went up in space in the 60s. In the words of President John, F John Fitzgerald Kennedy, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And then we went beyond what is there into a new, into this man-made everywhere, which is cyberspace. Invisible, indefinable, infinite. And just as dangerous or even more so than the old world. Because cyberspace is not a place on a map. Cyberspace digital, digitalization is everywhere. Over the course of just a few decades, the world has entered a digital age in which people from all over the world are connected online. In 96, only 36 million people used the internet, less than 1% of the world population. In 2017, that figure had risen to 3.7 billion, nearly half the world's population. Individuals and businesses, governments, NGOs, financial institutions, think tanks, they, we, are all connected, and we all use these endless resources, the endless possibilities of cyberspace. And I think that is a good thing, because digitalization brought us a lot. E-learning, e-health, unlimited information, 
shared knowledge, social media, Internet of Things, possibilities that seem to be endless, talking refrigerators, self-driving cars, and robots that can dream. But digitalization also brought us ransomware and fake news, the dark web, cyber stalking, digital espionage, and cyber attacks. And maybe even some Manchurian candidates we don't know about yet. Killers instructed through the internet somewhere out there. Yes, cyberspace brought us cybercrime and the need for cybersecurity. And to be honest, our society, meanwhile, has become almost totally dependent on digital resources. Critical processes like telecoms, water supplies, financial transactions are now completely reliant on our digital systems and processes. If one link in that chain breaks, it soon may have a domino effect. It will have direct consequences on critical processes in business and government, the earning power of companies in the daily lives of our citizens, not to mention indirect consequences. And the chain can break, and there are threats that will happen on purpose. Such purpose comes mainly from two categories of perpetrators, state actors and criminals. Their influence and deviousness is growing and continues to develop. State actors who try to digitally influence elections, but also reputations and public views. State actors who may even want to influence essential processes in society or even sabotage vital infrastructure, thereby undermining free society. Criminals present other threats. Let us first take a closer look at those. They continue to develop criminal revenue models, such as ransomware. Like in 2017, when organizations across the globe fell victim to a ransomware attack. In the Netherlands, one of the largest container terminals in the port of Rotterdam were attacked, among others. Processes were halted in the delays were lasting for days with severe societal and economical damages. In the United Kingdom, a more or less likewise situation occurred with two large hospitals. And criminal organizations who have no technical, technological expertise can orchestrate a ransom attack. They just hire the experts to develop and distribute the ransomware. Easy money, but big social and economic consequences. And they also find people who can develop and distribute ransomware on the dark web. Dark nets where one can find markets that in the real world would be completely illegal. Markets for weapons, drugs, assassins, and for me personally, one of the world worst, child exploitation. And this is why our governments must put money and means in the investigation and persecution of those internet criminal organizations. As we did, for instance, in the cooperation between the Dutch, US, and German law enforcement to get a hold on Hansa. Hansa was one of the largest dark web markets in Europe. There were more than 24,000 drug products on offer, from cocaine to specific sorts of MDMA to heroin, as well as a smaller trade in fraud tools and counterfeit documents. So the Dutch investigators started an undercover operation with fake accounts. The Dutch police was able to take full control of the site itself. And from that moment on, they could keep a digital eye on Hans's buyers and sellers, learn everything about them so they could be identified and even tricked uh, dozens of sellers in revealing their locations. It was a game-changing police intervention that packed a real punch against the dark web. Millions of dollars worth of confiscated bitcoins, more than a dozen arrests and counting of top drug dealers and a vast
database of user information. And that was an intervention that was only possible because of the cooperation with the US law enforcement and the German law enforcement. And that type of interventions must continue, as must close cooperation, because to stand up against the increasing threats, we must work with others, with other governments, other agencies, other countries, at political policy making, technical, but also operational level. Cyberspace knows no borders, so does cybercrime. So we have to think global to continue to pack those punches. For instance, to do that against international networks that distribute child abuse images. That is an important issue for me in the Netherlands because a huge amount of online child sexual abuse is stored on servers in or attributed to locations in the Netherlands. Because we are a digital hub, we have a high-end infrastructure that criminals misuse. And it's my aim to break that spiral. Victims deserve no less. So I started to organize a round table last year with the large digital companies. NGOs and scientists. And coming from that initiative, the sector itself decided to develop a self-regulating policy with a notice and takedown procedure. They will themselves see to it that unlawful content regarding child abuse is removed within 24 hours. Secondly, we built a hash check service that allows companies, especially smaller companies, to clean their servers up. And thirdly, the Tech University of Delft made a monitoring instrument that provides insight into which company hosts how many child abuse images. And last but not least, I initiated a legislative process to directly impose penalties on companies that do not remove the content within 24 hours after a report of child pornography or child abuse, including everything that goes with it. And certainly, it's not only the penalties, it's only, it's the naming and shaming that also will go with it for these companies. And to make sure that it actually happens, it will be supervised by a new independent national authority that will have sufficient enforcement resources at its disposal. Companies or directors who do not defer to this authority will be prosecuted. And all actions that will must help to slay the dragon of online child sexual abuse. Slaying these dragons to be cyber secure is an integral part of protection against threats in the digital domain essential for safeguarding national security as well. However, challenges to effectively combat cybercrime remain, especially the challenge of going dark. In other words, how do we maintain access to information and critical tools that our law enforcement needs to find these criminals? In Europe and the US, we have the same discussion on the use of end-to-end -end encryption by platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and others. And everyone agrees that victims of online child abuse should have our societal protection. Everyone agrees that we should do everything to find the heinous criminals that are behind those actions and prosecute them. And everyone also agrees that we have a right to privacy and data protection. And everyone agrees that we need to be cyber secure. So here you see that end-to-end -end encryption is both a blessing in protecting the right citizens, but it's also a curse in trying to prosecute the criminals. Many of the tech platforms have moved to use end-to-end -end encryption or are about to. And I do agree with people that end-to-end -end encryption is an important feature 
on privacy protection. But I also see how our law enforcement agencies are struggling with how criminals benefit from this shield of privacy. And we need to find a balanced approach to protect the victims and respect one's privacy. And I wish to stress only for that purpose, to protect victims of such heinous crimes as child abuse and child pornography. And we need to do this together with the industry and civil liberty organizations. And I propose to continue the dialogue with the tech platforms. And I agree with your Attorney General, Mr. Barr, that we need to call upon them to take their responsibility to keep the internet a safe place. Now, until now, I've addressed primarily cybercrime and cybercriminals, but of course the issue is much broader. We also have to talk about cybersecurity, state actors, because everything is connected. And that is why two small cities in the Netherlands uh, are on the, a United States list. And I'm afraid it's not on the Lonely Planet's list of places you must visit. On the contrary, I must admit, they're quite boring little towns. I hope nobody from those towns is listening. Um, but they are crucial security targets. Because in these two small cities, undersea telecommunications cables land on the shore. Fiber optic cables that are used for telephones, internet, television that connect Europe with America through the Amsternet Internet Exchange. An attack on those cables can have serious consequences for international internet and telephone traffic. In November 2003, for example, a relatively modest effect of one of the cables caused major internet disruptions in the United Kingdom. A coordinated attack on multiple cables might paralyze half the world. And as we see, state actors of various geographical and political background have been willing to try to influence our cyber-dependent systems to destabilize, or as I have pointed out before, to even sabotage our society. It makes us realize how vulnerable we are. How vulnerable we all are. For this reason, earlier this year, I presented in the Netherlands a national cybersecurity agenda. A free society needs a basic level of cybersecurity to increase our resilience against cybercrime and cyber attacks. And we have to ensure that our capabilities and resources to address threats are working. As the question is no longer, as one of our most reputed uh, academic institutes earlier this year reported, the question is no longer if a disruption will take place, but when. And we have to be prepared for that always. We have to make sure that cybersecurity is a basic consideration in the further development of our digital processes against those criminals, but also, I stress that, against state actors. We have to make sure that citizens, businesses, and public authorities improve their digital security and that the government fulfills its protective duty and the digital domain. And I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, to get this awareness across to the public is, you won't believe it, but it's one of my more difficult tasks as a minister. So at least we must work together we need public and private cooperation, and national as well as international. I thought there was some cyber attack already beginning, but <laughs> you never know. Maybe from the people living in one of those towns, they will find you. OK, um, well, because this lecture also nice to have on the internet, I hear it is streamed directly. I hope not through the cables that are arriving at the Dutch shore. Um, we cannot just rely on existing laws and regulations on security. Cyber has its own dimensions. One could even say that cyber in itself adds a new dimension in our universe. 
And that does not mean that we need a whole new set of rules and regulations, absolutely not. But as a society, we must reconcile the specific aspects of cyber with existing rights and regulations we have in our society. In that respect, I stress that new does not automatically mean different. Cyberspace is not automatically the exception, it does not uh, have a special status for exemption or whatever. So we de do not need to reinvent everything. We must simply explore what we need extra. And take upon us the challenge to become the cartographers of cyberspace. And we, that is society, involving everyone who has an internet interest or who has a cyber involvement. And it is clear that although we cannot be 100% responsible Governments must take the lead in this, but again, in dialogue with industries, with civil liberties organizations, with everyone to see where we can get to together. And we have to commit to a secure and stable country by recognizing threats to critical interests and increase the resilience of those interests. Be prepared for attacks and crimes, crises and incidents that threaten society but also take the lead in gathering and sharing information and knowledge. For instance, by stimulating fundamental and applied research into cybersecurity, and not only strengthen our own security, but also to enhance our national and international knowledge position and our digital autonomy. And I said it before, a government must take the lead in public-private cooperation. And that has already, in the Netherlands, I can assure you, led to many great public-private initiatives and results. I named you, for instance, earlier on, this uh, code that the internet companies already agreed on after we had a round table on voluntary uh, measures in uh, taking off child abuse material of their servers. So we also created the Digital Trust Center in the Netherlands in order to help businesses increase uh, their cybersecurity. And we developed a national system to facilitate the exchange of cybersecurity information. There is now a cybersecurity council and a cybersecurity alliance where public bodies, private organizations, and the research community work together to make strategic and practical improvements to cybersecurity in our country. But public-private partnerships alone won't be enough to respond to the ever-mounting threats. And when it comes to addressing security concerns, we must find a new balance because security can no longer be an afterthought. Remember what I said. It's not if it's going to happen, it's about when a disruption is going to happen. As a government, we must act earlier and more assertively in those situations where uh, a, a crisis or an incident would occur. And maybe even more importantly, again, work together with all the other stakeholders to be prepared as well as possible. I told you before, Netherlands has an internationally crucial digital infrastructure. That means that whatever we do, we cannot look at it isolated at a national level. We need international cooperation. Together with several partners such as the EU, we took a number of steps to keep up and become more resilient. However, due to the, well, rapid doesn't describe it, the incredibly fast technological developments, and on the other hand, the transboundary risks and threats, it is necessary to take the next step in international cooperation to increase security in the international digital domain. And you would have expected the Netherlands and the e US should work even more together. We're already natural partners in that uh, respect. Um, and I witnessed that in the meetings I had during my stay here in Washington with the various agencies, but also the corporates related to cybersecurity. We are natural partners. 
As a Dutchman, I admire the American approach. Your approach to cybersecurity can lead as an example on how we can develop even further. For example, the way the Americans handle critical infrastructure and supply chain risk management illustrates the possibilities and necessity of a common approach and cooperation. And on the other hand, you are also the land of the free and the home of the brave. Freedom as well as fundamental rights are in your DNA. And in my youth, I was much inspired, I know this is a long time ago, my youth, uh, by Steve Miller. You, some of you may recall his song, Fly Like an Eagle, which was about hope for the future. There's a solution, was the recurring line. And you know what? They called him the space cowboy, always positive, searching for answers. And by the way, never on drugs, but that's another theme. He did drink some whiskey. Um, they called him the space cowboy, and I certainly would hope the USA would be willing to take up the role as a future cyberspace cowboy. We need the USA if we want fruitful international progress on cyber. And as I said, it will only be possible to enhance cybersecurity through international cooperation and international legislation. We are a relatively small country, you all must know, although I, I'm proud to say we are 13 times bigger than your smallest state, Rhode Island. Uh, on Walt C. Muller's map, that's a consolation for those of you who are disappointed that he gave the name America to Latin America, uh, we, the Netherlands, were not even named on that map. We were ju then just a collection of low countries by the sea. But that sea, the threats and possibilities of all that water and us being below sea level learned us to cooperate with public and private partners and with people from the most different religions and backgrounds with an especially strong reputation in the maritime. It was not difficult to also ensure that in the maritime cybersecurity. And maritime cybersecurity sets a good example of the cooperation between our two countries. In this area, US and Netherlands took the first step in creating a partnership. We've got many shared interests when it comes to maritime cybersecurity. Creating a synergy in this sector by sharing information and best practices is the only way to keep our ships and ports digitally safe. And I'm very pleased to see that now other countries are joining the two of us in the cooperation, like Denmark, Germany, France, and UK. So whether on land or sea, cyberspace is a world we are still exploring, a world we have to map out, define, regulate. But there's still plenty of dragons at the end and at the edges of the map. We have the tradition in slaying those dragons lots of explorers, adventurers, and cartographers in our history to be proud of. But finally, okay, I must admit, we just missed out on discovering America first. But we were the first to discover Australia, not bad, long before James Cook sailed along. And a Dutch cartographer, Adrian Bloch, was in 1614 the first European to draw a map of your east coast with the island Manhattan or New ne Netherlands as it became known then. And okay, we should never have sold New York, but what can you do? People make mistakes, right? And as they say, failures achieved in the past offer no guarantees for future lessons learned, just as results achieved in the past offer no guarantee for the future. So we should consider cyberspace as a whole new challenge, a challenge that is difficult to know, difficult to grasp, difficult to map, and where we must not fear to now and then fail and make a wrong turn or a wrong decision. We have to challenge and we have to face it, this challenge, together, working together, talking together, like we're all doing here in these days that I'm visiting. That's the role we have to play if we want to take it further. And I'm really proud that we have such a great partnership 
on this with the U.S. and really looking forward to take the next steps. Thank you very much. Someone, and but I think you can hear me. Right? Um, I'm going to. Can I ask a quick question before I hand it over to everyone? Sure. Um, so I, I understand that when your prime minister uh, visited the country and met with President Trump, that they entered into an agreement that they would form a partnership, um, the Netherlands and the U.S. to work on cyber issues, challenges. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, um, could you um, add anything to that? general description about what that might mean and particularly where might you see the priorities. There's a lot of challenges. Cyber described broadly can cover a lot of different things, some of which you talked about um, today. Um, but what do you think the priorities uh, should be or are in that partnership? And can the Netherlands and the U.S. uniquely work working together kind of internationally make a difference? I think we can. I think the biggest priorities are awareness. Uh, resilience and risk management. Uh, now, risk management is something that we as governments with expert uh, uh, corporate companies, you know, expert in cybersecurity, we can take upon us. So let's not spend too much time on this. I would always invite uh, other uh, uh, stakeholders such as institutions, uh, civil liberties organizations, everyone who has a stake in this issue to join us on that. But I, I, I'm not so, um, I don't have great concerns that we, we can't get there when it relates to risk management. Going back to resilience, resilience is uh, only possible if awareness is created. If you have the awareness, then again, resilience is something I think we can solve again together, and I won't go into detail. I think I, I already uh, made some observations on that. So I come back to this issue of awareness. And just one anecdote, when this report came out in the end of August of one of the most distinguished uh, advisory councils, the Scientific Advisory Council in the Netherlands, uh, where they, the, the quintessential conclusion was it is not if a cyber crisis will happen at a certain point, it's only when. There was hardly any uh, media coverage of that, uh, let alone a shockwave going through society. And that getting the public, but also getting the opinion leaders, everyone aware that cybersecurity in fact means it's not a given that our cyberspace and our digital world work every day and every minute. It's something we have to uh, keep an eye on. So awareness uh, is a really very important uh, issue. And by the way, also awareness against cybercrime, which is kind of low with, with the public and even with corporate companies and awareness on cyber threats as well. So that we have to work on a lot, I think. Thank you. William will give you the mic. If you could just introduce yourself um, and tell us where you're from. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the sharing, sir. So my name is Ling Xingu. I'm a current graduate student from Johns Hopkins University studying engineering and international studies. So my first qu um, question is, well, I just learned something new from the gentleman who next, uh, sitting next to me. Like, people are talking about the cyber crime issues, like, even before I was born 25 years ago. So compared to 25 years ago, what is you know, like pose as a biggest change in terms of the issue. And right now, when we human beings are facing, you know, the ever accelerating of the technologies, like the 5G communication technologies and, you know, encryption technologies like blockchain. So how can we actually, you know, make these efforts and the progress to keep up with the advance of the technology? And second question, very quick, is you mentioned like government should take the lead while collaborating with the private industries and while raising the awareness would be the biggest challenge. So I wonder like what would you be um, your strategy, like grand strategy? Would you like to be doing something more like bottom up or top down, you know, to address these issues and challenges? Thank you. Okay, you, you don't mind that I 
more or less divide your first question into A and B. Okay, which is not a very digital way to approach it, but anyhow. Um, so the 1A question is indeed um, cybercrime has with us for some time. So how do you relate to that and, and what is the, uh, how has it developed and what are we facing, what are we doing about it? I think um, cybercrime indeed has swiftly developed in the past five years. We see that in statistics uh, and we see that also in police reports. Um, and I think we should admit as uh, governments and, and law enforcement author authorities in many countries that we were a bit slow in starting up uh, against, uh, against that. And in the past, uh, well, let's say four or five years, what I've seen is that law enforcement in many countries have picked up on it much more. There's more investment uh, in knowledge with law enforcement people that they know what it is about, what they're dealing with, what the measures could be to go against it. Uh, and also, um, from uh, the government perspective, there have been more campaigns towards the public to uh, watch out uh, for uh, uh, cybercrime. We're still not there, uh, and, and I think, and that, that is more or less your, your uh, B, uh, 1B, we must realize that it becomes very, very sophisticated um, and with that sophistication, uh, it, it won't so much help that our law enforcement has become much more sophisticated on cybercrime. Uh, you must take the public with you. And here again, I come with my more or less chorus of the song, which is awareness, 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 because um, people cannot uh, survive on the internet uh, digitally if they don't uh, have a certain amount of assertivity against these activities. You're, you're, so here we have a, here's a responsibility for me as Minister of Justice and Security, but also for other um, people in my cabinet to make especially vulnerable groups like elderly people, uh, like people who are less uh, digitalized aware of these threats. Uh, number two, um, I think we must realize that uh, uh, what is coming to us, the, the, the strategic challenges on uh, cyberspace relate very much to indeed create a uh, ideal world of cybersecurity, which no, uh, not a guaranteed 100% waterproof safe cyberspace, but to really uh, get cybersecurity to the maximum, which it is not now. I'll tell you, uh, I, I make you a small confession. So my country is much depending on dikes and dunes, and the systems there are also very much digitalized. Um, and I must admit that last year we found out that the part of the system is still running on 2G. I mean, for the elderly here, I would say, do you remember 2G? And uh, there, we, our strategy must aim at getting everyone, uh, also the companies that provide IoT products, for instance, or services, everyone into not only awareness, but also an active role in cybersecurity. And on the other hand, and this is what I said in my lecture, it's a challenge, um, but it's a necessary challenge we must meet to, de to develop our own cyber capabilities as well. And I'm. I'm, I'm honest about that. We, we are very cyber-minded, um, but we need the US, for instance, and we need other countries to develop that together. I think I did one A and B and two. The Minister, it's uh, Rafael Satter with Reuters. Um, I had a question about the balance issue that you raised uh, with regards to encryption being a blessing and a curse. Um, why couldn't the balance be established uh, between um, full end-to-end -end encryption and law enforcement hacking, for example? Is there anything that, uh, that government hackers uh, you know, need more or that they can't accomplish, that they need to weaken encryption in order to accomplish it? Well, 
First of all, I, I think if you want to reach a balance in a problem, then it's foremost that everyone who has a stake in the problem is involved in finding the solution. And you know those situations uh, uh, in, in, uh, at school or at university, you were into a conflict and uh, there was a mediator and five parties were involved in solving the issue and you were not involved and you come up and you say, hey, where's my stake in the solution? So we need to do that with the tech companies, with the uh, the, the civil liberties um, organizations with law enforcement agencies and with the governments responsible for cyberspace. That's number one. And number two, uh, standing here today, um, I don't know the end solution of the equation. I'll admit that to you. Uh, and why is that? Because I need to know, you know, what, what are the exact detailed interests of all concerned and how can we then, and we need experts on that, how can we balance them in the right way. But let me assure you, I'm not a, 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 a backdoor man. I, I think you know what I mean. I think we have to solve this. If we solve this in the right way, we have to uh, look each other in the eye and find a, let's call it a front door solution. That's the only way that it'll work. But I hope you do realize my problem is not so much that we have uh, all types of communication that have encryption or end-to-end -end encryption. I mean, in the old days, that was when I was at school, I'm sorry for those of you who weren't there in those days, but in the old days, you had, a, you had the right to the secret of the letter. And uh, when I posted a letter to my grandma, I can assure you it was no sensitive state secrets in those letters. But I, uh, I, I sealed the letter, and no one was allowed to open that letter. So this is of all times end-to-end uh, -end encryption. It's also from the analog world, and we must respect that. My issue is not so much that. My issue is that uh, in the old days, um, uh, the, the old mail letters were not massively used for communicating this horrible and I really, I am telling this everywhere, this horrendous type of child uh, pornography, child exploitation, and what have you. And this is one of the, my, the, one of the, the, the flaws of internet. internet. It has brought an ideal communication for this kind of crime. And I want to solve it, and I want the help of uh, other stakeholders. I don't want to sit at a table, everyone sitting like this and saying, uh, I have my interest, get out of my room. Okay, sorry for the long answer, but this is because it's so important. There's a gentleman, oh, sorry, I'm sort of an auctioneer telling you who to. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, my name is Jeff Odlem. I'm a recently retired um, State Department Foreign Service Officer diplomat. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in hearing a little bit more about your vision for what effective international cooperation and international, I think you said international legislation or regulations would look like, um, and the role, for example, of international bodies like Europol or Interpol or the UN agencies who do law enforcement like, uh, like uh, UNICRI or UNODC. What role should they play in helping set global standards and enforce global standards, or do you see it being continuing to be a, a, a bilateral and, and nation state function? Thank you. Well, I, I would certainly, uh, sir, um, prefer uh, solutions that have uh, uh, global standards with possibly a sort of a, a band uh, for specific uh, geographically uh, defined uh, situations, okay? But I've seen how uh, Europol has really uh, developed uh, the uh, uh, crime fighting and law enforcement in, in the EU in a positive way, taking with it in a positive way human rights in uh, respect to law enforcement. So um, uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, an evangelist of those kind of corporations bringing us towards global standards. And it was your compatriot Carnegie who in, 
I always forget it was 19, which it was in 1905, I forget, I'm sorry, who, who initiated the Peace Palace in The Hague and already had this vision of, you know, getting uh, these uh, types of issues more on a globalized basis. And we're not talking to the, today about war crimes, but I think the Nuremberg trial was a gigantic breakthrough. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Before the Nuremberg trial, and we thank that to two Jewish professors, one from Lvov in Ukraine and the other from uh, the United States, I think from, from uh, Boston. Um, and they invented the whole concept of genocide and were the architects of the Nuremberg trial. And, you know, it's, you, you cannot almost not anymore imagine a world before that. So when we talk about cyberspace, we need those kind of uh, internationalized standards. So we can, I, I think if we have that, we can have a massive, uh, make a massive mileage in the whole subject. There's more, one more gentleman, with, he's, he's already uh, with his hands in the air for an hour, so I mean, let's reward him. Hi, Mr. Mr. Minister, Sean Lingus with CyberScoop. Um, I'm wondering, you know, you say you're not a backdoor man, but what, how is this time going to be different in terms of a search for a technical solution to, uh, you know, so-called so going dark? Uh, every expert I talk to says that um, you can't really accomplish what you're trying to accomplish without subverting security controls and, and making the internet less safe for a lot of people. So what, what technical experts are you talking to in your search for a, uh, an answer to the going dark challenge? Um, yeah, you, you mean um, in a, how to get to a solution which creates the balance we discussed before. No, it is, prob it is problematic, but you know, the, the reason that I am stressing the urgency of this discussion, that, that I, let's say, I, uh, uh, I understand that your Attorney General has, with his letter of beginning of November, brought forth this, this urgency because the expansion of, uh, of, of uh, and I'm talking about heinous crimes. I'm not talking about phishing mails or whatever, okay? Uh, I'm talking about, indeed, things like uh, child exploitation, et cetera, through internet. Well, in my country, and I spoke to the experts here in the U.S. in the past uh, days, it's the same there. It has grown exponentially in a shocking manner, and we uh, so what I'm bringing into this situation is not that I've decided who's going to make the technical solution. I, I, I don't have the arrogance even to think that I can bring that forth. We must try to find a working compromise, and I don't have the solution now. But the only thing I'm bringing in is this problem is going so much out of hand. You know, when I was uh, in my, my 20s, child pornography and everything around it was, man, it was to be found where? In some dark alley or whatever? It was, you, you couldn't get to it, if you know what I mean. It was really a problem that the law enforcement agencies, they attended to it, and it was horrible, and it happened, child abductions and whatever, but it was, well, it was an overseeable societal issue. And these days, uh, it is, I'm, I'm making this alarming uh, statement, it is going way beyond us. And you may have noticed, I'm not talking about things such as hate speech, for instance, because I find there already you have a component of uh, freedom of speech, whether you like it or not, and then the discussions become far more hazy. I'm talking specifically about this issue, and you know what? the the big internet companies, when they came to this round table, everyone agreed that freedom of speech or any other fundamental right is not at stake in this situation. Everyone agrees to that. 
that, that people who are involved in this have more or less um, rejected their own fundamental uh, rights to freedom of speech or whatever. But again, so I, I hope I don't disappoint you. I don't have a ready answer how we're going to do this technically. The only urgency I bring to the discussion table with stakeholders is people, we must now discuss it. In America, I think Messenger is much bigger than WhatsApp and Instagram, okay? In the Netherlands, Instagram is vastly popular. WhatsApp, even more. Our police have, through, uh, through, through other ways, because they were given access to telephones, found out that the chat boxes of WhatsApp, that is already end-to-end -end encrypted in the Netherlands, have uh, enormous, uh, uh, that there are chat boxes with enormous exchanges of child pornographic material with children being offered to uh, uh, to, to people uh, for a price, etc. And I went over to the NCMEC, the National Center for um, um, uh, the Missing and Exploited Children, sorry. And they had statistics for the US and for my country of what was reported by the various social media. Until now, Facebook has reported a lot of this stuff going through Messenger because it doesn't have end-to-end -end encryption yet. In the Netherlands, WhatsApp, the number is like this of reports. Why? Because end-to-end -end encryption makes it impossible to get there. So I stand here saying, um, and maybe that is a slightly different tone from the letter your attorney general sent. I don't know, but I think we, we share the same view we must have a roundtable discussion, sit with each other saying, how are we going to deal with this problem? So I hope you understand that is my problem and not so much the problem how will uh, end, to, uh, end encryption in the end uh, go further. Because I think end-to-end -end encryption is a, uh, well, it's, it's a technical fact of life. Okay. Thank you again, Minister. I'd like to welcome the panelists up to the stage as I um, briefly introduce all of you um, that will be talking. So come on up and um, I'll, I'll introduce you in the order in which we're going to have our discussions. Uh, first, um, Theo uh, van der Plaas, who's the Deputy uh, Chief Constable um, from the Netherlands, the National Program Director on Cybercrime and Digitization. After finishing um, the Dutch Police Academy in 1986, he started his police career in The Hague as an inspector. In 2015, he became the Deputy Chief Constable, head of the operations of the cent Central Unit of the Netherlands Police, um, which includes having the portfolio hold um, of which um, he deals with the digitization and cybercrime issues. He's responsible for the setup and organization of the cybercrime teams and implementation of the fight against cybercrime in the Netherlands. Next, we're going to hear from Jen um, Daskal, who is a professor and faculty director of the Tech Law Security Program at American University in Washington College of Law, where she teaches and writes in the fields of cyber, national security, criminal, and constitutional law. Following Jen, we're going to hear from Matthew no Noes? Noes? Noes. Um, who is from the U.S. Secret Service. Matt is the Cyber Policy and Strategy Director leading the off Office of Investigations, Policy, Strategy, and Outreach Section at the Secret Service. In that role, he's responsible for leading the development of policy and strategy for the Secret Service's 162 field offices and over 3,000 agents and staff that execute the service's integrated mission of countering threats to the financial systems and safeguarding designated persons, location, and events. Um, throughout his time at the service, his work has been primarily focused on strengthening the service's ability to counter risks posed by transnational cybercrime. And last but not least, we'll hear from Greg Mata. Greg is a 20-year um, veteran of the FBI, where he currently serves in the FBI's senior service as a science and technology policy advisor and the division privacy officer in the FBI's operational technology division at the engineering research facility at Quantico. 
The uh, Operation Technology Division is the FBI's component responsible for technically implementing court-ordered wire, wiretaps for the FBI. So I'm in that order, hopefully you guys will all be able to, um, um, as briefly and succinctly as possible, um, uh, give your views on uh, both of the subjects of cybercrime and um, the issue of lawful access. If you'd like to come to the podium, feel free. And then hopefully we're going to leave some time uh, for Q&A. <laughs> well, um, I think our minister just uh, told a lot of also about uh, the Dutch police. So I'll keep it short for you, so I'll keep the speakers for some more time. Uh, cybercrime and cybersecurity is, of course, closely connected. And as our minister just told us, uh, resilience of society is key in this. For us as police force, as the, the Dutch police force, the Dutch national police force, 62,000 police officers, about 17 million inhabitants of the Netherlands, is it key to make um, a close connection towards all these private partners in the Netherlands as well? but also during our investigation, when we have information that will prevent cybercrime, we have to share it as well. So we have also some prevention actions in the Netherlands that will uh, combat cybercrime on a different way, prevent cybercrime instead of getting the crux, because that's of course necessary. We need to have a certain domain which is also available for everybody, everybody in the Netherlands and the world. We also see in the Netherlands that, and I think it's in America the, the same way, that society expects the police to be in the digital domain. And we started in 2007 with the, the high tech crime team with 120 police officers. 120, 60 were experienced police officers, but 60 of them came right from the university. And they were closely connected and they were committing cybercrime in the early years about 270, 2007 till, well, let's say 2014. And then we came up with, well, 10 other teams in the regions because we saw that cybercrime was evolving, evolving so much that we have to speed up. And we made these teams not only with technical, but also digital experts, intelligence experts, financial experts, but also specialists dedicated to our public-private partnership because we think that we have to do that together, not only from the state of the police force. Um, the strategy of the Dutch police so, is not only attribution of the uh, crux, but it's also about prevention. It's also about a victim notification. Uh, and we do, it, we do that because we do that in a way, in a certain way that we do investigate but sometimes we get the information, of course, from the public or private partners as well. And then we share it. And this model will bring us much further. And I'll give you an example of um, the way we do it in a nationwide scale. For instance, last year we had webstresser.org. You might have noticed that. Uh, you can buy there any attack towards Adidas within maybe $25 uh, and you can, you could, because we caught the cracks, we, you could have uh, bought uh, a stressor attack. And this was a, a huge amount of, well, uh, attackers that have been uh, uh, bought these uh, attacks. We think ultimately about two million people were involved in buying these different attacks, two million. Team Hyter Crime, in an international cooperation with other countries, um, investigated it and arrested the administrators. But on the other hand, we get so much information about people who were, who were buying all these DDoS attacks that we could combine this information and through the channel of Europol, distributed it to other countries. So these other countries could arrest or do something else with the attackers. Ourselves in the Netherlands, we also went to the families because we saw that buyers of these DDoS attacks were not only criminals. These were also sometimes schoolers from 13 or 12 years old. And we had a strategy what we, what we called knock and talk. We went to the families, we knock on the door and we talked to the parents because we don't want our youth to be criminals in the digital domain, but keep them out of it. 
So that's also part of the strategy of the Netherlands. I'll give you another example about getting far more close together. Three years ago, we, uh, you, you heard the minister talking about ransomware. Three years ago, we did an investigation and we had a lot of keys which are used to be unlocked when you have a ransomware on your computer. And together with other companies, security companies, but also other countries, in the last three years, we uh, offered these keys to anybody who would like to have them. As soon as you have a ransomware on your computer, you can go to this site, nomoransom.org, and you can look whether your ransom attack is available, the keys for it. And you might wonder, but over 200,000 people get their keys. And instead of $108 million going to the criminal fields, uh, it didn't went because we gave them the keys. All these victims which were attacked by ransomware. It's just two examples. Do we have any, any well, difficulties in offending this cybercrime? Yes, we do. It's still very hard in an international way to exchange information as soon as you see that these cracks go from one country to another one, transporting their servers or their information on their server to another country. So we still need some European, but also international cooperation or other legislation as well. And we, sp we have to speed it up. Still, I think, and I'll, I'll finish, I think the cooperation will be um, best when we do it together with the private partners, the universities, and of, of course also the other law enforcement agencies all around the world. And I would say think big, act big, and act small, but do it together. Thank you very much. Uh, here, particularly with our partners from the Netherlands, uh, which have been tremendous partners of the Secret Service over the years, both the Dutch High Tech Crimes Unit and then also as the host of the European Cybercrime Center at The Hague. The, uh, uh, you know, as the, the minister highlighted, uh, one of the challenges the Secret Service has been focused on is the profitability of, of cybercrime, uh, that there's an illicit revenue that's reinvested to develop capabilities, platforms for criminals to collaborate, and then they make those tools available for, for actors for political reasons, in addition to uh, uh, criminal uh, reasons. Uh, and to tackle that requires, uh, as the minister highlighted, cooperation, uh, both internationally and also between uh, government and private companies, particularly uh, technology providers and platforms uh, to address the, the harms and risks that come from criminal exploitation of the, the tools, technologies, and platforms they provide. Uh, and so that's part of what uh, the Secret Service has, has long focused on, is, is building that uh, sort of cooperation. Uh, for uh, you know, 40 years ago, uh, Secret Service was first directed to investigate uh, crimes related, uh, fraud related uh, electronic transfer of funds by the Secretary of the Treasury at the time. And we maintained that core focus on the financial sector and, and developed an expertise in cybercrime. And it wasn't until about 20 years ago that we really saw the emergence of transnational organized cybercrime, which presented a distinct challenge and also required a different approach in law enforcement uh, to really affect those criminal networks. Uh, that are operating overseas, causing harms uh, globally to address that. Uh, and so the partnership with uh, countries that, that are like-minded and preserving existing human rights protections, even as they confront uh, new cybercrime challenges, has been uh, fundamentally critical. The, the Council of Europe uh, Budapest Convention on Cybercrime has been a key instrument to allow for the exchange of information amongst uh, the signatories to that uh, treaty, and also ensuring commonality in the, the criminal laws to affect that cooperation. On ransomware in particular, uh, uh, which has really grown over the last uh, nine years where they combined uh, uh, the availability of public key uh, cryptography along with uh, blockchain technology to have a reliable payment mechanism. Uh, uh, it, it, the minister hi rightly highlighted that is a, a strong emerging challenge. One of the key ways to, to go after that, similar to what the Dutch had time High Tech Crimes Unit has done in a variety of areas to include the Hansa marketplace, is, is target those platforms that are key to its operation. Uh, so BTCE was one of the largest cryptocurrency exchangers. Uh, estimated over 90% of all 
uh, ransomware revenues were exchanged out through that. Uh, that totaled just shy of $1 billion uh, until it uh, ceased operation in uh, July 2017 through a joint operation. Uh, so targeting those revenue streams for the criminal actors, addressing how they're profiting from these activities, developing capabilities that are used for a range of purposes uh, is fundamental to, to how we've gone about tackling this. Uh, and those partnerships with uh, countries like the Netherlands will continue to be critical in doing that going forward. Great, thank you. Um, and um, it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Control without regard to the location of that data. And conversely, this law also attempted to respond to a growing concern of foreign governments about the inability to access, in particular, communications content from US-based providers because of US laws that prohibit US-based providers from disclosing that content to foreign governments directly, even when those foreign governments are seeking data about their own citizens in the investigation of a local crime with local perpetrators, local victims, local witnesses, and established a mechanism by which the United States could enter into executive agreements with foreign governments pursuant to which those foreign governments could make direct requests to companies subject to a number of baseline um, procedural and substantive requirements designed to address and ensure that minimum human rights standards were met. Um, there's been one draft agreement that was announced um, about a month ago between the US and the UK. Um, once that's submitted to Congress, there'll be a, there will be a 180 day waiting period before that can actually go into effect. And I think the hope is, is that that will be the first and a model for other agreements, including um, as, as I understand that there are ongoing discussions between the US and Australia and um, likely to be um, ongoing discussions between the US and the EU as well. Um, but again, all of this, um, our efforts to deal with the problem of kind of going dark broadly of which encryption is one piece of this. There's also a need for ongoing efforts to facilitate access to data um, regardless of, of, of the encryption status, status but that the encryption piece is just one aspect of the challenges that law enforcement faces in, in accessing and using data in its investigations of criminal cases. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Greg Mara. I'm the Senior Science and Technology Policy Advisor for the Operational Technology Division in Quantico. Um, so I'm the uh, uh, going dark representative on the panel. Um, we now refer to it as lawful access. Uh, going dark describes, I guess, the, 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 the scope of the problem that grows, and, and, but lawful access, in our opinion, and I think you'll hear internationally it's being referred to as lawful access, really describes the nature of the debate, which is what is the, what are the requirements of the law and what is the balance the society is going to allow with regard to granting law enforcement the ability to get the evidence that's necessary to stop some of the most heinous crimes that that society has to deal with, uh, child uh, exploitation being one of them. Um, you know, we held at the Department of Justice, uh, the director spoke at length, uh, a lawful access summit on October 4th. Um, and, and uh, it, you know, the director made really quite clear uh, the problem is really growing exponentially. There's hardly a police department in the United States that's not being affected. Um, I think everyone here in the room who has children knows that WhatsApp is ubiquitous and everyone's using it. And so it's affecting every single level of crime across the United States and every single level, every single department. Uh, when children are communicated through WhatsApp or other types of communication uh, apps and then abducted, they're frequently abducted with their phone and the phone is destroyed. Um, you know, and so they become, I guess, in the views of some people, the allowable cost of, increase, of that marginal increase in security um, that, um, that people argue should be allowed by uh, prohibiting lawful access. It's a kind of, uh, well, I'm not a victim and my need for privacy is so much greater than yours and because I'm not a victim, I really can't uh, and don't want to give up uh, the marginal increase in, in privacy that I believe I'll gain, or I've been told I'll gain, uh, relative to um, to a lawful act, what I'm told is a lawful access to diminution in security. Um, and, and certainly that's not what we believe is the appropriate 
uh, cost-benefit analysis, you know, in our constitution. Um, I'm a Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts attorney, and former prosecutor, and actually a former defense attorney as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and some years ago, uh, a legal specialist assigned to the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal at The Hague. Um, I remember sitting in a presentation in Constitutional Hall in Daniel Paul Plaza uh, of a um, constitutional historian talking about the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution and the Constitution's preamble uh, describing that the founders felt it necessary to say that one of the core purposes of the Constitution was to ensure domestic trans tranquility and security. Um, and, and he made the point, and, and it stuck in my mind many times in the lawful access debate, that the founding fathers, many of whom were targets of, of the British crown because they were known to be rebel rousers, they were, they were pushing for independence, uh, were targets of many, many different search warrant executions. And in those days, these were generalized warrants. They were signed blank. The, the, the military came in, searched your house, and, and looked for any evidence of a crime, and then it was all filled in later. You know? uh, and, and the point he made was, you know, in that environment, it's just astonishing that they wrote a constitution um, that actually allowed for the access to the search of people's homes. <laughs> given that they were just the victims of the most tremendous abuses of, of, of the searches of their homes. Uh, it, it would have been foreseeable for them to think, you know what, we're going to have a constitution that says, you do not get to search the home, period. You're, you're, no, you're not going in the home. Um, and yet they didn't. They didn't. They had the foresight to realize that in order to maintain security and public safety, there had to be a balance between individual privacy expectations and the need of government to protect other, everyone, and, and, and certainly the most vulnerable society, to be able to get into the home. There had to be checks and balances, there had to be appeals, there had to be a process um, that was lawful, that protected, preserved the core rights of the Bill of Rights, all right, but that fundamentally there had to be that possibility. Encryption changes all of that. Encryption shifts the entire debate to maximizing the individual's interest at the cost of anyone else in society. Right? And, and, it's, and when you think of its implications uh, for, for law enforcement across the United States, you know, I lived for many years, considered my home uh, New Gloucester, Master, uh, New Gloucester uh, Maine, uh, south of Lewiston, Auburn. Um, small little town, we had, we had a phone company was just for Gray and New Gloucester. The Gray and New Gloucester Pine Tree Telephone Telephone. Um, it had six police officers. Um, so in their world right now, almost all their crimes involving more than one player are being communicated through encrypted apps. What would we recommend? Oh, well, six police officers whose starting salary is somewhere in the 30s. Well, you, know, you need to send them off to become lawful hackers, right? <laughs> that's, that's the solution to that problem, um, is, that, is that we'll have an army of, of law enforcement officers studying uh, software uh, cracking techniques? And is that really the kind of society you want, the kind of police departments you want across the whole domain of the, the United States? That, that's not a solution. Um, and frankly, let me just say in response to the question that was asked, um, you know, for the lawyers in the room, I think they all understand the problem with even lawful hacking techniques is of course they have a very limited lifespan. And in a criminal proceeding, there's, there's quite rightfully disclosure. You, the government, has the burden of proving how the evidence they want to use against the defendant was authenticated, that it's original. You can't just say, well, we used a tool we don't want to tell you about, but trust us, the information it yielded is accurate and it says you're guilty. All right? Who would want to have that in a, in a trial process? So, so the reality would be, what would you do with a world where every department is supposed to have software engineers trying to create zero-day exploits for for every single um, piece of uh, software that's out there. That's not a workable solution, certainly not at the criminal level for law enforcement. Uh, and it's not financially viable, certainly for state and locals. You know, I have to say, and this is my own glint, thus far I've pretty much communicated the views, because I watched them carefully last night, you know, the Attorney General and the FBI Director, but I have to say, you know, I was a state and local prosecutor, and, and what I see and I, and I chide my colleagues at the Bureau that deep down I'm still wearing state and local underwear. Um, and, and I'm not a Fed, but, but I am a 20-year Fed. Um, but I have to say, 
it, this problem is fundamentally shifting federalism in the United States. State and local law enforcement officers are becoming incapable of investigating crimes that involve any level of encryption, and encryption is becoming ubiquitous. So what do they do? They have to turn to large agencies. Now, there are some large players, New York, LA, Chicago, something like that, who may have the resources, but it's, it's federal agencies they turn to. And federal agencies aren't, aren't filled with limitless resources. They have to pick and choose. And so now the federal government will decide, based on its resource allocations, which of the state crimes in your neighborhood will be given resources to be solved by the state and locals. Is, is that the federalist model that we want for law enforcement across the country? Now, we're looking for a collaboration with industry. There's so many adaptations of, of encryption um, you know, that certainly we realize we're not in a position to try to dictate the, the, the solutions to that. And by the time we even uh, attempted to, which we don't have a desire to, it'd be obsolete by the time industry had moved on to the next uh, level. And so, so we're looking for industry to work with us um, to, to create lawful access. And in response to the question that was asked, let me just say about, well, who are these cryptographers who say it's possible? My, my first response would be, well, Bill Gates, who I have to assume has knowledgeable people working for him, all right, has said, this is not a question of technical inability or even sec uh, security. It's a question of willingness in the industry. All right? There have been articles published by some cryptographers offering lawful access solutions. And they've also publicly commented that, that they've been told by their colleagues it's taboo. If you're a cryptographer selling crypt cryptographic products, it's largely the industry. Why shoot yourself in the foot uh, proposing new cryptological regimes um, when the whole of industry, your major customer base, is saying that they don't want to go in that direction. Where is the, the worldwide multi-million dollar award challenge to get the best and brightest uh, of our cryptographers to look at this question and determine what is the requisite level of security and w then what is a possible solution to balance those interests? Okay, Greg. Thanks for that, but I want to make sure we have a few minutes I just wanted to rile up the crowd. To kind of, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I want to make sure if there's questions in the audience that we try to get at least, I think we should uh, maybe collect a couple of them and then have um, the panelists would be the quickest way. Um, microphone, William C. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alan Friedman asking a question. My personal capacity as a cryptographer and a scholar of, of security economics for about 17, 18 years. I wanted to pick up a thread that Matt brought up, which is the potential of choke points to solve uh, large scale cyber crime, like the minister mentioned, uh, which is going after payment, right? We have the National Academy study and many other studies that say, even if there are technical solutions out there, they're not easy. We also have dozens of papers that say, cryptographic currencies are incredibly easy to disrupt. We can track them. Uh, the ones that are widely used and easy to use are not actually anonymous. Uh, is there been talk about how we can use that as a point of addiction, right? The value of, of going after the choke points like the Hansa market that the Dutch did? Uh, yes. At least we have, yeah. Do no, we have another question? If we don't have any other ones, then you got it. <laughs> uh, uh, the, you, your point is correct, right? That uh, there's inherent value in a public ledger and an immutable public ledger from a perspective of law enforcement. Once you can link an identity uh, to the coin, you, to the uh, key used in that transaction. Um, there are challenges when it comes to privacy enhanced coins or anonymity enhanced coins uh, in that regard. Uh, and uh, you know, FinCEN has, has been clear on the obligations of money transmitters and exchanges into that uh, ecosystem and the obligations they have to comply with law in terms of operating as a licensed money transmitter. Uh, and then also their know your customer obligations under money, la money laundering statutes. Um, uh, so that, that is exactly uh, uh, correct and, and targeting those illicit flows. Keep in mind in the aggregate estimates of money laundering activity globally, cryptocurrencies remain a relatively small player. Uh, bulk cash smuggling, trade-based money laundering, a variety of techniques to move value overseas. But as it is absolutely a component in how you tackle transnational crime, is going after their ability to move the revenue uh, from their illicit activities. We get that. Um, William, how are we doing with time? 
You're long past it. I think this is, okay, last <laughs> question then. Uh, Lucy Montgomery Pope from the British Embassy. Um, you talked about this being a question of willingness of the companies to come to the table and to talk about this problem. How do we encourage companies to engage when there isn't a line item on their budget for these kinds of uh, heinous crimes and the children who are being exploited? Is that for me? <laughs> I'll want to. I can answer that as well. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I'll, I'll start. The, uh, um, I think the minister framed it right. There, there's an element of just the social responsibility of businesses and helping them understand how their platforms and technologies are being used to cause harm, both to their customers and to society more generally. And I think when you can have a conversation that looks at the harms being caused and encourage them to accept uh, their role and what they can do, consistent with their business model, but also consistent with their ethical responsibility to society, uh, to address and mitigate some of those harms. You can have substantial cooperation and productive dialogues, um, uh, but it, it, it really has to be centered on understanding that social responsibility and those broader risks and how to address them. How does it, it, work, work, in the, how does it work in the Netherlands? I think uh, I can add to that to the, uh, not only the responsibility of the companies themselves, but also public pressure pressure will help. Uh, discussion in the Netherlands, but also here in the United States, uh, make it happen that uh, people say, well, what are you going to do with, for instance, with my data? Uh, then you see a movement comes around. So I think the responsibility of companies will rise as soon as the this public criticism on this subject will uh, go up. So I, I would stimulate that. I would just add, at least in the United States, there is an enormous amount of information sharing, particularly with NICMEC and, and other entities um, and emergency disclosures. So the, obviously the encryption piece changes that a little bit, but, um, but there is an enormous amount of information sharing in emergency situations. And, and the only other comment would be, you know, there's been a public hearings in Congress in the last few weeks. Um, as many people know, Section 230 of Title 47 um, uh, creates uh, an immunity from lawsuit uh, for the publishing of many of these companies for harms and, and uh, this is not the Bureau's uh, engagement but a number of members of Congress have, uh, this was, this statute was enacted at the time to kind of encourage the development of the internet when it was in its uh, fledgling stages and, and many in Congress voiced the opinion that um, it may be time to revisit that given, especially with regard to child pornography, uh, what's been going on. The truth is, um, you know, that would change the business model <laughs> substantially and that may create some level, or even, even the discussions today may create some level of incentive to, to put more money into this arena. Well, I wanted to thank everyone and especially the panelists. Thanks for your patience as well and the minister. Thank you for joining us today um, and hope you guys enjoyed your time here. Thanks and sorry for going over a bit.